And our uh, next guest speaker has come all the way from the West Coast. He is our non-Northeastern uh, um, affiliated speaker, and uh, but he has brought along a special guest, and so we may give you an opportunity to take a little bit longer than what is on the program. It will be well worth it, trust me. All right, so without any further ado, I would like to bring to the podium Professor Terence Mugen, uh, who is an internationally renowned scholar and teacher. Uh, he has focused for many, many years on um, international students, the international experience. Uh, he found a, a great gap in how the development of international students throughout their educational journey and beyond, and he uh, is addressing that in very tangible ways with his important research program. Please welcome Professor Terence Mugen from Portland, Oregon. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, thank you to Dr. Puffer for this very kind invitation. Uh, this has been some time coming. It all originated at least 18 months, two years ago as a thought, as a, as a, as a germ in uh, Dr. Puffer's mind, and um, obviously we know the reasons why it was delayed. So again, qualities of resilience and qualities of uh, purpose, I think, uh, are required in these circumstances to, to make something good happen. And um, I'm also extremely grateful to uh, the Northeastern University and to Dr. Ludden for the excellent introduction to the event. Um, I was particularly struck by the use of the term dialogue. Um, dialogue takes the form of language, and that's one of the things I'll be talking about in the course of the next 45 minutes or so. Language and languages, which we feel are an important dimension of the international student experience, which probably need more exploration and merit more uh, attention uh, in order to cultivate the global mindset. Uh, first of all, let me just introduce the project uh, that Dr. Puffer referred to, the International Student Experience Project, and give you some background to that, and then I'll, we'll move into uh, a coverage of the main activities and findings from, from that project so far. It's an ongoing project. It's been running now for about two years, and um, we're in the process of publishing initial results and initial findings and then deliberating on ways forward. So I'll say a little bit about those things as we move through this session. So the adjustment process of international students to their changing environment, evidence from the ISE project. The adjustment is something of a synonym with adaptation, which is used just as frequently in the literature. And it obviously is an attempt to describe the process of movement from one cultural location to another cultural location where there may be significant differences between those two places in terms of behaviors, uh, communication, um, lifestyle issues, environmental contextual issues, politics, uh, religion, etc. The concept of culture is of course central to, to the ex international student experience insofar as it uh, accompanies directly and, and kind of irreplaceably the academic journey that the student goes through. Um, we see a strong connection between those two things, which once again we'll be looking at in a moment in a little bit more detail. Let me first of all tell you a little bit about myself so that you can understand maybe where the idea and ideas come from. Um, my background is, is originally, academically, educationally, was as a linguist. I studied foreign languages in the United Kingdom, uh, primarily from the age of 18 onwards. Um, you may be aware that the British system uh, entails a relatively early specialization of subject choice at the age of si uh, 16 rather than 18. So you choose three or four subjects generally that you're going to specialize on in those two years of study. I specialized on languages, including English, French, and German. 
And that was something in hindsight that seemed obvious to me and natural to me. Nowadays, those kinds of calculations and processes uh, take a little bit more deliberation because there are far more opportunities in higher education than there were in, at that, this time in the mid to early 1970s. I was born in Liverpool, which itself is a not exactly multilingual, but it's certainly a multicultural location. It's a very cosmopolitan location, one of the largest trading ports in the world in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, so we were used to a traffic of human beings coming through our city. And that traffic involved human beings from all over the world, of all cultural, ethnic backgrounds, of all forms of uh, occupation and all forms of levels of prosperity. Um, it's, it was a natural thing for us to, to encounter difference. And I think that came in very, that became a more important factor as I went through life. I did my year abroad in France and Germany as a, as a student, as an undergraduate student. Uh, this was a very English uh, experience at the time. England, classically Britain, classically believed itself to have a deficit in terms of foreign language learning. Um, and the government promoted and funded uh, this period of study in a foreign country as a compulsory part of the undergraduate program. Uh, and it seemed like a really nice, easy ride to most of us. There were no academic credits involved. We simply were doing it for the purpose of improving language proficiency and understanding the, uh, the culture of the country whose language we were studying better. I went on to become a professor of languages first um, as time went on. Um, I then started getting an itch. The itch started off as the culture itch in the 1980s, after having done quite a lot of teaching of French and German in small companies, and kind of thinking, well, these companies need the French and German, but they need something else too. And the culture itch was this sense that there was a form of knowledge that needed to accompany the foreign language learning in order for that foreign language learning to be fully successful and fully productive as far as their job and work was concerned. Uh, I had a number of posts in the UK, Canada, and the USA in the remainder of my career before retirement two years ago. Uh, the last one was as, as program director at Royal Roads University in British Columbia, Canada. This was a very distinctive experience because it represented a very sharp contrast with my own experience of studying in a foreign country. These students were working obviously on a fully accredited program and by in being program director I got some really clear insights into, these, into the degree of commitment and the degree of risk and the degree of investment that they were making in this program. I'd been teaching international students all my career of different sorts, uh, but this was probably the defining uh, moment for me in terms of wanting to know a little bit more and to try to contribute a little bit more on a macro level to the, to the appreciation of what these students were undertaking. So I uh, initiated a research project at Royal Roads in 1917 uh, with Professor Wanadu, who is known to at least one other person in the room um, as a Royal, Royal Roads alumnus. And um, we carried that out over a period of nine to 12 months. It was an appreciative inquiry research project, and it really involved trying to understand um, how these students were contributing, learning from the university, and what kinds of services uh, could be developed in order to help them to make more of their experience and to carry on on the trajectory that's laid out within the Canadian context of long-term employment and long-term contributions to the Canadian economy. Uh, I think it's a, a very, very special process. What kind of came through in, in, in all of this uh, and I'll come back to this later, is what the linguist does, what the linguist is. These students may, be, may not be characterized as linguists because many of them have never studied foreign languages. They learn English as a kind of a lingua franca uh, in practice uh, and through studying. But they're not, not necessarily all studying foreign languages the way that I did. And it struck me that 
one of the things that these students have and have to contribute is nonetheless a role as a linguist. And if you think of all of these films that we see on Netflix nowadays, it made me think about what linguists do and are. And linguists are, in some respects, spies. Linguists gain access to information that non-linguists don't gain access to. They have decisions to make about what to do with that information. And it gives them power, and it gives them responsibility, and it entails risk. And I think that when we talk about the global mindset, I believe that this process of deep integration through a command of languages and use of languages is one that is deserving of more attention. So I'll come back to that later on. The International Student Experience Project as it stands today was initiated by myself um, from 2018 onwards. And as indicated already, its origins were in the Royal Road study, but it, this became a different animal in some respects because this, we, I wanted this to be a collaborative project from day one. What I mean by collaborative project, I wanted it to be a project that wasn't funded by an external agency. I wanted it to be a project that was driven by people who were experts in the field. I wanted it to be driven by people who were sharing equally and freely, uh, knowing that they had a sense of trust amongst them so that processes of academic output and processes of other forms of development of the knowledge that we were acquiring would be openly and happily shared with each other. What was the problem statement that we all had in mind? It was very broad. I'll just give you a couple of examples here. The poor deal scenario. Do international students get a deal from their host institutions which reflects the kind of investment that they are making in those institutions? And the suspicions among many, many um, academics, but also I think many others, that maybe that deal could be improved in many places. Um, the fact that within the international student community, there are visible migrants and not so visible migrants, and the fact that the inter that international student community can in some respects be distinguished as being uneven in its, within itself, within its own makeup, and within, within its own composition, and do we give enough thought to the impact that the visible migrants, uh, the, the experience of the invisible migrants have in comparison with others. And of course, the final one that it receives a, a lot of policy critique is that uh, international students in some places and at ce in certain cases are simply cash cows for universities. Um, can, we, can we test that with students themselves and can we see what form of reciprocal value is being provided within the, um, within, within the relationship between universities and, and international students. One of the important things that I want to point out here is that we also wanted to look very broadly at the international student experience. Uh, once again, a lot of literature focuses on international students studying in English-speaking cultures, English-speaking locations, um, because that's where the main traffic has been for a long period of time between Asia and between uh, the Western world. Um, are we, is that a full representation of today's international student experience? Well, let me tell you that it isn't. We have within, the, within this network, within our group, we have students from China studying in France, in English, but in a French-speaking context and being involved in, a, in at least a tripartite form of cultural interaction because of that experience. So again, richness and breadth was important that we, want, we wanted uh, the geographical scope of the study to be as comprehensive as it could. So in terms of structure, that's the challenge that we took on ourselves. Okay, so what is the context in a little bit more detail. I'm not going to dwell on this for too long, and you can see that I've marked some areas here with, where, that, that I will focus on because there's a lot of detail here, there's a lot of breadth, there's a lot of different perspectives that we have to take into account. But obviously, 
the status of international students in the host university and communities is, is variable from one dyadic relationship to another. Uh, an international student coming from, say, a, a former partner, cultural partner country of the United States or of the United Kingdom, and then studying in those places, is probably not in, in such an intense form of experience as students who really cross boundaries of, um, of linguistic and cultural and political and diplomatic scale. And so we know that international students face issues relating to visas, uh, high fees, culture shock, different academic culture, etc. Missing family, poor employment prospects. Uh, I mentioned yesterday evening an example of a Royal Rose student in, uh, from India who in the, in the middle of the program had to fly back home to India because he, his family was enmeshed in, a, in, a, in an ethnic conflict in, in, a, in, a, in a particular area of India which was very violent and, and it was very extremely worrying. He was back within 10, 15 days and he made nothing of his, of his he made nothing of this drastic shift in his circumstances and an expense that he had to undergo in order to go home and try to help his family get through, get through the shock of this experience. Uh, this places, this, this geographical scale of shift and drama obviously places massive stress and strain on international students and it's, it's a pretty commonplace thing and of course in the last two years we know how many international students were almost trapped in very, very uncomfortable circumstances during the early years, early period of the pandemic with very little, very little guidance in the initial stages from, from their universities. Obviously, everybody was peddling like crazy to put that right, and much was put right. But none, again, the geographical distance between home and host culture at a time like that gets even bigger than the number of miles that, that you have to cross. Okay, so what we're really talking about is a high dependence of universities on these in incoming students, particularly in, in Anglophone countries. And we have a simultaneous imposition of English as a level of compliance and performance, overshadowing other talents and competencies in many respects. International students, through the whole process of recruitment, through the whole process of allocation of visas, through the whole processes of academic recognition, obviously have an enormous number of obstacles, barriers to overcome in order to establish themselves in their, in their host university and host context. The burgeoning reality of multilinguality in society and organizations means that individuals can be monolingual nowadays, but organizations can no longer be. International students um, and migrants generally bring a form of diversity and richness which manifests itself very, very clearly in language processes that host countries are beginning to understand. One of the biggest growth areas in the contemporary economy is the language services industry, um, which is, again, re responding with the use of technology to try to build bridges between international migrants and the communities that they go to. So, I'm going to propose to you that language is a key construct in individual and organizational identity. Using English is not a sign of cultural deference. When students use English, when students say they want to learn English, why are they wanting to learn English? Well, some want to learn English as part of a whole package of Charles Dickens, William Shakespeare, and Princess Diana. Other students simply see English as a code that enables them to transfer across one location to another with ease. And again, we need to think that we need to think carefully about this relationship between uh, language culture and study in, in, in trying to understand what the students seek to achieve. So our project had a very, very long list of descriptions, aims and objectives. Our aim, our aim is to research and improve understanding of a diffuse contemporary social group on a global level. We wanted to take students out of, the inter, out of their institutional context and see them as a global, see them in a very diffuse and a very 
intersectional way as a global community of people who are traveling, studying, and finding ways in which to anchor themselves, finding ways in which to develop their own mobility. We share a desire to break free of the limitations of nationally driven conceptions of the international student and understand how students as individuals sense and navigate the geography, culture, languages, and psychology of the experience. So we're not to, we're, our, our objective is not to assess universities in any way whatsoever. It's really to see the whole experience from the bottom up and the, student, uh, the student's personal and um, cultural background as being an agent in this, in this exchange. We want to get a better deal for students in terms of their status and contribution in university life and beyond. Uh, we're not sure that uh, the attempts of universities and the work of universities notwithstanding, we're not really sure about which, company, which countries and which communities really deliver a promise to international students. Is the promise simply to provide a degree, an award, or is the promise to provide a lifelong relationship of some, some kind or another? And we really believe that more research is needed to understand what students are contributing on a global level, not just, on a, not just in terms of students' individual program of study, uh, but on a global level to the international community, the international economy, all of these macro level political economic justifications for international education, what are they actually leading to? Are they leading to real delivery of uh, rewards, real delivery of opportunity, etc.? So what have we done so far? Well, we've done data gathering, analysis, conference presentations, preparation of articles. We're academics, so our currency is publishing, our currency is, is knowledge, it's research, it's learning, uh, but that takes the form of publishing. And that's where we're at at the moment. In fact, we just had uh, two articles submitted to leading international journals, and we're all very anxiously, all 13, 14 of us, very anxiously waiting, awaiting the outcome of that. We put our emphasis on the self of the international student. In other words, we, we, we want to hear from the student how the self, how their self relates to their context. Uh, we're not asking them to grade the universities, we're not asking them to grade the countries. We're asking them to say, what is this leading you to be and to do? How, how do you respond to uncertainty? How do you respond to change? Uh, because they're the factors that will stay with them all of their lives. They'll, that will characterize their future mobility and their future experience, that they develop the personal attributes needed to make the most of the opportunities in the context they're in. Our, our main references in, in a disciplinary sense are to intercultural communication and language as metrics of personal progress. We adapt theories from international business to the international student experience. This is because what we know about international business is based on research into executives uh, in the latter part of the 20th century from the 1950s, 60s onwards. What we know about culture shock comes from executive uh, assignments. What we're trying to do is to use international students to update and improve the, those concepts and those kinds of personal experiences um, so that we now have a, we have a contemporary view of what the global international traveler, sojourner, does and, 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 and attempts to, to do. So we, adapt, we, wish to, we want to give a voice to international students which is independent and diverse. Uh, here are the institutions and organizations involved. Um, University of Warsaw, University of uh, Berg Academy Freiburg, University of Strasbourg, France, Clermont also in France, Copenhagen Business School, University of Helsinki, Alto University in Finland, University of Loughborough in the United Kingdom, University of Bologna, Italy, Kentucky in the United States, and very, very, very pleasingly, University, Northeastern University in the form of 
Dr. Sheila Puffer. Uh, we have a whole series of people participating from those, from those institutions, and we have an advisory team comprising some of the leading scholars in international business and international uh, intercultural communication and relations, Anvil Hartzing, Mary Yoko Brannan, who's here today, um, Mark Peterson, and Anne-Marie Soderberg are people who advise our younger researchers on, on their work and on their progress. Research design and flow. We started off with a quantitative study in late 2018, and that was designed to run until mid-2020, um, and it was led by Mikhail Wilczewski with partners from the, some of the other universities. This was the design of a, of a quantitative survey, and um, all of a sudden, in January 2020, we had what's called in the literature an environmental jolt. You'll all know what that was. Uh, it was more than a jolt. <laughs> and it completely derailed what we were doing temporarily. Um, we had to realize that we couldn't, we couldn't complete it on the same terms as we'd begun it. So what we then decided to do was to complement that study with a, with a qualitative study uh, led by Mary Vigier and Mikhail Wilczewski. You'll be hearing Mikhail talking a little bit later in this session. Also Mary Vigier from University of Claremont, Michal is from uh, University of Warsaw, and Michal will also be talking about the Seoul study, which is a separate scale that he's developed to uh, assess and analyze online learning, the online learning experience of the international student. So, the overall our overarching research question that we've been working on is to what extent does social communication contribute to satisfaction and psychological well-being of international students. We all know about satisfaction surveys, and this is partly a traditional classical satisfaction survey. You know, how satisfied were you with the Hotel Albert in, in Paris when you stayed there? Um, well, this is more than this. This is more than that, because this is, when we use the term satisfaction in the context of this study, we're talking about the student's sense of satisfaction with the entire experience, with, and with themselves. With themselves as people who have uh, encountered issues and tried to resolve those issues. Uh, satisfaction in the sense that they feel that they are independently assessing their own progress, their own performance, and their own adjustment, and their own contribution to not just the classroom, but also to the place that is hosting them. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, to some extent, a measure of, of personal responsibility, which we think is important. Okay, so social communication in the host cultural environment is an established dimension of intercultural uh, development, intercultural communication and relations. And uh, I won't go into too much into that here, but basically we're building on the literature of Kim, uh, Ting Tumi, and several other Gudikuns, several other leading intercultural theorists to try, as I said earlier, to to bring these theories up to date within the context of the international student. So we're going to have short, some short reports now from colleagues who've been leading these sub-projects within the overall project of the international student experience. The first is from Dr. Juan Adu, who is um, he was associate professor at the University of uh, Royal Roads University in British Columbia. And Juana led the evaluation of the data coming, from the, coming out of the quantitative study. Secondly, you'll be hearing from Dr. Mary Vigier, who is at the business school in Clermont-Ferrand, Clermont France. And Mary helped design and execute the qualitative study that happened, that began really in March, April 2020, because everybody was keen to know what's happening to these students uh, within, the, within the disruption caused by the pandemic. And then Dr. Mikhail Wilczewski, who is at the University of Warsaw, will talk about um, the, the Seoul, the student online learning experience scale, which he and his colleagues have developed to try to measure student satisfaction with that shift from a face-to-face -face learning environment to a, an online learning environment. So if we could have that rolling now, please.
Good morning, everyone. Glad to join Dr. Terry Mohan's keynote talk today. My name is Huana Du. I'm an associate professor in the School of Communication and Culture at Rogers University, British Columbia, Canada. I started my academic life as an international student studying in the US and also had a chance to visit different universities and countries in previous years. As a researcher in the area of intercultural communication, my research interest has been inspired by my daily work and interactions with international students. Currently, I'm the program head of MA in Intercultural and International Communication, which hosts the international students from more than 15 different countries. I have been working with international student studying MAIC in the last couple of years to hear their intercultural stories and experience. In particular, I have found it quite fascinating how our cultural and social experience frames the way we communicate, interact, and adjust during daily interactions. I'd like to share a couple of insights developed from a recent research project with ISE, International Student Experience Research Team. We have presented the manuscript at the 2021 Academy of Management Conference. The paper is titled, Social Communication, Adjustment, and General Satisfaction across national study of international student experience. Survey of international student are generally conceived through a single national cultural lens and don't capture or convey the personal story about the international student experience. We conducted a survey of international student studying in 10 different universities in six countries. A sample of 916 international students was analyzed in this study. International students have to cope with academic challenge studying English taught programs as they don't speak English as their mother tongue. In addition, those linguistic and cultural challenge to communicate and interact in the host culture add another layer of complexity to the context of our study. As international students also needed to navigate in the host culture to achieve effective communication competence and intercultural transformation. Our results advanced the understanding of international student social communication with different ethnic groups in the host culture. They contribute to the contradictory viewpoint on the role of communication with co-ethics. Our findings confirmed a significant positive impact of host social communication, which is communication with domestic student, rather than co-ethnic social communication on satisfaction of international student. Our results also contribute to the literature on communication competence by analyzing and framing the role of international student multilingual skills besides their English proficiency. Our study has very important practical and policy implications for the creation of education ecosystem to facilitate diversity and inclusion. Thank you very much to the conference host, Dr. Sheila Pufu, for this great opportunity to share some research findings with all of you. I hope you will continue to enjoy the conference. Cheers. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Sheila. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Vigier, and I'm Professor Emeritus at ESC Clermont Business School in Clermont-Ferrand, France. I hope you're enjoying the conference. Our business school was established in 1919. We're one of the top business schools in France in the French Grand École of Management Network and are triple accredited. We have over 300 international students out of a student body of 1,200 in a very friendly 
student-friendly city. I'm going to talk to you about the qualitative study that we carried out and presented at the European Academy of Management Conference this past year in June. Our research aim was to explore language and communication challenges and the coping strategies that international students devised in academic and non-academic contexts. We interviewed 50 international students in six universities across four countries, Finland, France, Italy, and Poland, and we analyzed our data thematically. I'm going to share two quotes with you. The first one is from an academic context, and it's quite positive. Caroline expressed the importance of using the host country language to be more integrated with the domestic students, even though it was a challenge for her as French was not one of her native languages. She claimed it was better for her integration. The second quote involved a non-academic context, a Korean student in Poland was proud because he, he tried to speak Polish whenever he could, but was asked one day, where did you learn your Polish? And when he responded in South Korea, the local student said, oh, I see, that's the reason, as if to say his Polish skills were not as fluent as he had thought. We contribute to the literature on language in international contexts. First of all, we confirm the adverse effects of the language barrier on social integration and interaction in the host country, even though the language of instruction may be English, it's highly critical to be fluent in the host country language since lack of host language fluency excludes international students from informal communication networks and socializing. However, as we saw above, speaking the host country language does not necessarily guarantee effective communication. What does this mean in practice? The first takeaway is the importance of raising awareness of promoting inclusive language policies and practices, helping international students learn the local language prior to departure and even on arrival. Another takeaway is the importance of finding people to translate for them and helping them connect interculturally across language boundaries and barriers. Another important takeaway is the importance of online communication with teachers and peers to promote uh, social support. And finally, to set up work group assignments to facilitate engagement between international students and domestic students. Thank you for your participation in this conference. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this fantastic event and Terry Mugen's speech. My name is Michał Wilczewski. I'm Associate Professor at the Faculty of Applied Linguistics at the University of Warsaw in Poland. The University of Warsaw is the largest university and number one research center in Poland. We have over 40,000 students, and currently we are hosting around 3,800 international students who mostly come from Ukraine, Belarus, China, and Turkey. I'd like to introduce you to our most recent research on the pandemic online learning experiences of international and domestic students in four European institutions. The University of Bologna in Italy, Giesek School of Management in France, University of Warsaw in Poland, and University of Liverpool in the UK. 
Due to the last year outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, millions of students have been struggling to adapt to the new learning mode. The pandemic has had a detrimental effect on students' well-being and learning, mostly because of limited interactions and socialization with peers and teachers. We responded with this research to scholars' calls to investigate the effects of the pandemic on students by developing a tool that captures various aspects of the experience in online learning in various national contexts. We reached our objectives by conducting four studies. In the first study, we reviewed prior models of online learning and carried out exploratory research by asking students in Poland to share their learning experience during the first months of the pandemic. We established four major themes in students' experience, which overlapped with prior literature. These are online interactions with students, interactions with teachers, university support and commitment in online learning, and finally, students' capacity to participate in online learning, which involves access to the internet infrastructure and comfortable study conditions. We tested this four-factor model in the second study using online survey data collected from international students in Poland. This confirmatory research established not four, but three distinct aspects of student experience. We found that students view interactions with teachers and university support as the same phenomenon. So we merged these two factors and refined the model. We tested the refined model in study three using new data from both international and domestic students in Poland. This study confirmed the three factor structure. In the last study, we tested the cultural invariance of our questionnaire using data collected during the second and third wave of the pandemic from international and domestic students in France, Italy, Poland, and the UK. We also examined the explanatory power of the questionnaire by correlating each aspect of the online learning experience with various academic variables. The results in this table confirm that each aspect of the online learning experience predicts students' academic performance, adjustment to online learning, student satisfaction, and loyalty to the university. Adjustment is understood as psychological comfort with the new study context, and loyalty as the intention to persist with the program of study. The correlations are positive and significant for both groups of students. This means that more satisfactory online interactions and the higher capacity to participate in online learning are associated with an academic success in both groups of students. With this research, we contribute to the online learning literature by developing a tool that effectively captures three different aspects of students' experience. Our tool may be used by universities to monitor students' academic experience and develop relevant support structures enhancing students' experience in the pandemic and post-pandemic online learning. The pandemic has been distressful for students, so we need systematic research on both academic and psychological aspects of students' experience. Finally, numerous research reports have shown that students often lack access to acquired study space and digital infrastructure, so we find it relevant to investigate the online learning experience among vulnerable groups of students. For example, those who don't have favorable studying conditions, access to the internet, or those studying across different time zones. I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to attend this conference and share our results. I hope you enjoy that and I wish you fruitful discussions. Okay, so very quickly, just to wrap up these studies, we've got two models here that are emerging as a, as a way of expressing the findings so far. This model is a conceptual model and it incorporates uh, a number of concepts in a scale involving interaction frequency and the ethnocentric, ethno-relativism ethno dimension of, of Bennett et al. Thank you. And you can see that what our research finds in, but through both the quantitative and qualitative studies is that the student has a journey through the concepts and capabilities acquired in language and cultural competence to take them successfully through social interactions and then towards personal adaptation and satisfaction um, in the top right hand corner. This is more of a kind of a personal process model, basically saying that interaction with hosts, i.e. daring to engage in host language and English, leads to interaction adjustment, 
which consists of attaining linguistic and intercultural competence in the host environment. And finally, that leads to socialization, which is general satisfaction with the self. So what we believe is that this cultural and social and linguistic process is central to the student's sense of self and, self and sense of ultimate adjustment to the foreign location. So what I'd like to do very quickly now is just to take you through two, two quick stories uh, that, that I think illustrate some of the issues involved here as far as how universities uh, develop policy and develop teaching strategies to try to implement the kinds of uh, lessons that come from this research. The first is about language. Uh, and here, it's not just about languages, it's about languages. The two things go together. They're two kind of quite separate things in a way, but they belong together, language and languages. And here's some data from the US Census in 2017 showing that in the Boston area, you can see Boston in this list is third from the right, uh, in the Boston city area, almost 150 languages are spoken at home. Um, that number of languages is very close, similar to a number that you had in your, in your earlier talk, yeah, I think, uh, across your network. 30% uh, of the metro area population of Boston, age five and over, speak a language other than or as well as English at home. So languages in the plural are here. They are not in foreign countries. They are here in Boston. And learning for a large proportion of our population passes through the relationship between multiple languages. Think of the consequences of this in schools, hospitals, and the workplace generally, both from the point of view of supply in terms of employability skills and from the point of view of demand in terms of needs of citizens, consumers, patients, etc., And think about how that process is going to evolve in the course of time. I believe that it's, uh, it, it's not exactly something about to happen. We know it's happening, but I'm not sure that we all understand the scale of it happening. And as I said, if you look at the growth of the language services industry and how powerful, they, how, how powerful their services have, have proven in times of deprivation recently in the pandemic, you can see that this is a serious issue. I'm gonna tell you a very quick story now about a university case. And this is an, anonym, an, an, an anonymous case, uh, which I, I will keep anonymous because I don't think it's fair really in, in, in what is essentially a transmitted forum to go through this in too much detail. This is the story of a university professor who attempted to stop international students speaking Chinese on the US campus and she had to step down after an outcry. She had said to these students, keep these unintended consequences in mind when you choose to speak Chinese. The linguist is an outsider. The linguist is a spy, is my kind of poetic epithet. Basically what happened here was that some Chinese students were sitting in a, in a, in a um, lunch area and uh, they were talking Chinese to each other. Hold on a second. Um, these students were talking Chinese to each other quite loud. And they were interrupted by two members of faculty who asked them to stop speaking Chinese. The students were disappointed, or the faculty were disappointed that the students were not taking the opportunity to improve their English and were being so impolite as to have a conversation that not everyone on the floor could understand. The program director then warned students to keep these unintended consequences in mind when you choose to speak Chinese in the building. The assistant professor said she had respect, but basically this was effectively a form of faculty policy or university policy that she was implementing. This email went crazy on Twitter and generated uproar and was retweeted thousands of times. Students of the university received a second email in the afternoon from the dean of the medical department. Complete change of tone. There is absolutely no restriction or limitation in the language you use to converse and communicate with each other. Your career opportunities will not in any way be influenced by the language you use outside the classroom and your privacy will always be protected. The program director asked to step down and the 
uh, the dean said that the university's Office of Institutional Equity would open a review. A committee of Chinese students at the university launched a petition calling for a full investigation. They were disheartened by faculty members implying that students of diverse national origin would be punished in academic and employment opportunities for speaking in their native language outside of classroom settings. Nelson Mandela said, if you speak to a person in the English language, in a lingua franca, you speak to their mind, you speak to their brain. If you speak to the same person in their language, you speak to their heart. The role and place of language in, a, in, a, in, a, in an academic environment is not determined, sorry, is not determined only by efficiency of formal academic learning. It has to take into account the identity, the concerns, the anxieties, the needs of students. And the language the students speak to each other is the thing that expresses their emotions, their deepest thoughts and their deepest concerns most lucidly. So a rather negative story, and one I'm sure that caused much reflection and much consideration. What I'm going to ask to my colleague and wife, Mary Oko Brannon, to do is talk to you briefly now about something that was a little bit more positive, a little bit more constructive. And this is a project that she led and I helped out with a few years ago. And this is taken from the world of work. And what we try to show here is how an organization, a, a business organization, can seek to draw on the talents and the resources of people of different linguistic and cultural backgrounds rather than trying to railroad them into, into single uh, forms of communicative practice. So could I ask Mary Oko to step up and just take, take us through some of her thoughts about how that experience maybe relates to what we've been to, I've been talking about so far. Okay. Thank you. Well, how do you get this thing up? So I'm going to go through a, a lot of research <laughs> and a lot of work in about five minutes. Um, but I'm going to distill it, hopefully, in ways that you can remember it um, later on. So one of, the, one of the things I've learned from uh, my first graduate student is a new definition of culture, which I think is very, very helpful. And that is that culture is a help system, H-E-L-P. H stands for habits, E for expectation. L for language, both informal and formal, nonverbal and verbal. Um, and P is for your perceptions, okay? And what's interesting, um, what, what uh, the International Student uh, Experience Project uh, has been highlighting in many ways is that international students, as well as immigrants, say, 100 years ago, um, were all about adaptation, um, integration, assimilation. And what's different now about this new demographic? So international students um, are a big representative example of what we call, what cultural anthropologists, which I am one of, call the new demographic, which is people who are multicultural. People who are living with multiple help systems as one. I myself was born and raised in Japan with missionary parents, and I believe that there could be heaven and hell and reincarnation, two balls up in the air that, are, that for most people don't go together. So being able to live with a plurality. In this project, uh, Tesco, one of the, the third largest food retailer in, in, in the world, uh, was losing its profitability in its home in the UK. And however, worldwide, it was doing still the, the third uh, strongest retailer and growing. And it was growing due to the performance of its Asian subsidiaries. And we had this opportunity uh, to devise a study, internal study um, for Tesco, to learn from their global footprint uh, in order to revitalize uh, and, and grow 
um, competitively the UK home operations. And so what we did is we devised a study where we had nine of the Asian managers from six different Asian countries go to the UK for three months to be insider ethnographers of Tesco. And we gave them a crash course on how to be ethnographers. And in it, what we said is, I, I like these acronyms that you can remember really quickly, but um, as an ethnographer, the quick and dirty way to explain how to be an ethnographer was for them to do what we called the flying spaghetti monster, FSM. F is look what you see, um, note what is familiar in what you're seeing at Tesco UK. What's familiar here? And of course, they're all from Tesco, right? Tesco in six different Asian countries. And the second is what's surprising? That's the spaghetti part. What's surprising? And then M is what do you want to learn more about? Okay? So FSM, that's pretty much what ethnographers do. And what companies, what, what multinationals are interested in these days is learning from the other. It's not the other adapting to them, but it's learning from your global footprint, being able to sense what's new in the world and then be able to meld that back into the home organization and redeploy it. There are so many industries in the United States that failed, the facsimile being one of them, uh, because you, the U.S. was parochial and didn't see that in many parts of the world the facsimile would not be dead. Uh, because of different types of writing systems, different help systems. And it's the different help systems um, that, that give an entrepreneurial edge to these companies so that they can reinvent themselves and for sustained renewal. Okay. So this was a really cool experience, experiment that we did with Tesco for them to use insider ethnographers. Um, you can see a little bit about this. What was really interesting, and this is where I'm going to leave you with, um, is that of the nine uh, managers, the, most, the person who had the most surprising and what can we learn more about from Tesco was, spoke the worst English and she had never left her home country before. She was the least cosmopolitan. Uh, she was from Thailand. And not only didn't she speak English very well, but she had railroad braces, braces, you know. So even if she spoke English, it was hard to understand her. And her notes, uh, in terms of um, the comparative, um, uh, the things that the Tesco UK could learn to reinvent itself, were the strongest. Interestingly, she had the longest tenure at Tesco. So even though she wasn't um, conversant in English, and even though she didn't know anything about England, she knew a lot about Tesco. And she knew that, wow, what they're doing in Tesco UK doesn't look at all what I learned Tesco was supposed to look like. And you know, for example, people were stocking the shelves in the produce by throwing bananas onto the shelves. Well, she thought, well, maybe the English don't care if their bananas are bruised, you know. I mean, but she was looking at what's surprising and what do I want to learn more about. And then she found, well, the the KPIs is that what they're called? They, you know, were such that they were making them throw the bananas on the shelf, and uh, so not caring about the produce. So it's just one example. Um, and the people who had the the least to offer Tesco were the managers who we would call bicultural bilinguals. People, for example, there were two managers, one from China, who had gotten her master's at Cranfield. And she was really useful for the team when they first came over to England because she knew how to use, um, what do you call your metro? Um, <laughs> The underground, yeah, um, and and uh, she she knew how to get around. She knew the language, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but she didn't have any uh, spaghetti in her FSM. She everything she, she she had adapted so well to England that nothing was surprising. And it was funny because Sheila told us yesterday that we should come to this pavilion. She says, "Oh, it's easy. It's just on the other side of campus." Well, you were doing the the, you, know, you, you thought everybody would know where this was and we wouldn't have any trouble finding it. But if you had just said, go to the front gate of Northeastern, you know, there it would be 
And that, that would be something that a, a person, a foreign other, would say, but not someone who's so used to knowing where this is. So we take for granted things that we know. So I'll just end with the, the three competencies that, that we, so we as academics did a study on these insider ethnographies and the three competences that we found that biculturals, multiculturals have that are, that are very, very valuable, that they don't know they have and the people that hire them don't know they have are the first is cognitive complexity, being able to see the forest as well as the trees. And so, like I said, that I grew up thinking of heaven and hell and reincarnation as being able to be there at the same time. You know, being able to have a wide picture, um, that's one of the competences. The second is perceptual acuity, being able to see the trees as well as the forest. So what is different, what's surprising. And then being able to suspend judgment and say, how does this work here for you? Oh, well, work differently for us there because we didn't have your KPIs. <laughs> we didn't have this kind of pressure on us at that time. Okay. And the third is reflexivity. And so multiculturals, biculturals are by definition reflexive. They're comparative. They're always contrasting and comparing. And this is actually what companies want. They want to be able to learn from their global footprint. And now more than ever, here's one more thing about the new demographic, is that they're interconnected because of the media, because everything can be online. So it be, before they would come to a new country and they would not be connected to their home country. Now they are connected to their home country so that they can still understand what is going on there and how what you might have in this country might be utilized differently in their country. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. There's, there's more written about this. So thank you, Mary O'Connor. And just very, very briefly, I suppose that if I was going to try to connect uh, our research with what we heard from Dr. Ludden earlier, it would be that a global mindset has to have some form of cognizance of linguistic relationships in mind, if, if it's going to be truly effective. That learning about another culture as an objective piece of script in your own native language is, is, is inadequate. You, or in, in, in the English language, sorry, learning about it in the English language is inadequate. There has to be forms of learning which capture this dynamic relationship between languages and the, the self-satisfaction, the self-perception, the reflexivity, and the assets and the resources of the individual. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Mugen, uh, for a, a very rich description of a research project that involves international scholars from around the world, and it involves international students and domestic students from around the world. It's truly impressive, uh, and a major effort in recruiting uh, the faculty members to take responsibility and to collaborate. Producing these papers um, with individuals who are working remotely and kind of working on different parts of the papers and so on, is an exceptional feat of teamwork. And teamwork and working with people of different backgrounds is the key to success in the workplace, in the academic environment, everywhere we go. Thank you for that. And thank you for bringing your distinguished spouse, Mary Yoko Brannan, to also give us some background and insights into the work that she's involved in. She is an internationally renowned international business scholar. Uh, she has a long list of accomplishments. She's highly regarded in the field. And it was just a wonderful surprise to have her join us and enrich the conference as well. Thank you, Mary Yoko. Please give her a round of applause as well. Well, we have just walked in the room uh, a very, very relevant person, I should say, 
and before he gets away, because he, like Mary, is exceedingly busy. Mary alluded to that just a few moments ago. So before we go to our break, please welcome to the conference um, um, Senior Vice Provost for uh, International Everything, uh, the Office of Global Services, Malik Sudaram. Please welcome him. Thank you, Sheila. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, I am the Associate Vice President for uh, Enrollment Management, uh, overseeing international, and I also oversee Office of Global Services uh, and Graduate Enrollment Management. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is an important event for us. We have uh, uh, Ms. Anna Choudhury from our team representing Office of Global Services, and. Uh, understanding how we can support our international students on our campus from this learning that we would have here. Um, I appreciated all the research that uh, Dr. Terry Morgan had worked on, and we were uh, looking to collaborate further to see how we would implement some of our learnings from this research um, in supporting our international students. As many of you know, uh, we grew from being fourth in the country in uh, US uh, three years before to being number one in the country to host international students um, in US campuses, uh, which I feel um, very much proud of my team who has supported this growth and being able to support both from an enrollment management perspective as well as uh, providing the student support that the students need after they reach the campus uh, has been Rewarding for all of us, uh, me being an international student myself, I've gone through it and uh, I would love to do anything possible to make a difference uh, in every international student's experience here at Northeastern. So I look forward in uh, learning more about this conference. I'm sorry I'm in and out, but uh, have a wonderful conference and uh, a good weekend as well. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Malik. It's a pleasure having you here as you uh, run around from one place to another and take care of so many things that make such a difference to our students, faculty, and staff here. Many thanks. And please feel free to join us for coffee and uh, come back throughout the day as you walk around the campus. Thank you. <laughs>